Hello, we are going to talk about how um, section 13.5, which is applications of the equilibrium constant. So we've talked about how to find k, now we're going to talk about how to use k. Okay, so we can predict a lot of things about the reaction from the equilibrium uh, constant. For example, we can look at the tendency of the reaction to occur, not the speed of the reaction, but the tendency to occur. Uh, we can look at whether a given set of concentrations represents an equilibrium condition, so we can use it to calculate things, and um, we can also determine that the equilibrium position to see if it will be achieved from the given set of initial concentrations. Uh, so, for example, let's say we have an experimental K of 16, and we calculate the K value to be 0.9. This means that the reaction must move to the right, in order to achieve equilibrium. So it gives us some information about the position of equilibrium. Okay, well a K is much larger than one. This means that the reaction system is going to consist of mostly products. So we would say that equilibrium lies to the right. Reactions with large Ks essentially we say go to completion. Because they're so large in the reaction or the equilibrium is going to lie to the right, most of the products are going to be produced. So we would say that that's being completed. If the K is much smaller than 1, this means that the system is going to consist of mostly reactants. And so we would say that the equilibrium lies to the left. So we have more reactants than products. This causes the reaction to not really occur to any significant extent because our equilibrium lies mostly with the reactants and not with products. So the size of K and the time to reach equilibrium are not directly related, however. Okay, so even if K is really large or really small, that just indicates the position of equilibrium, not the time it takes to get to equilibrium. So let's look at a value that we can use along with K to help us see which way the reaction will shift. So if we have the, a concentration of one of the reactants or products is zero when we start, it's really easy to see which way the reaction is going to shift. But that's not always the case. And so we need to use what's called the reaction quotient. And it, we use a capital Q to, as its symbol. And we use Q to determine the direction the reaction will shift to reach equilibrium if we have con initial concentrations of all of our reactants and products. And so we apply the law of mass action, so we're going to write it very similar to how we write the equilibrium constant, and we're going to use initial concentrations, not equilibrium concentrations. So if we look at the synthesis of ammonia, and we can write a Q value, or a reaction quotient value, of uh, the concentration of NH3, this zero means that it's the initial concentration. We're squaring it because of the coefficient in the reaction. And we're dividing it by the concentration of the reactions. Again, initial concentrations. And we have 1 and 2 and 3 H2s. And we can compare the values of K and Q to determine which way the reaction is going to go to reach equilibrium. We'll determine the direction of shift. So if Q is equal to K or very close to K, that means that the system is at equilibrium and no shift will occur. If Q is much larger than K, this means that we will shift to the left. The initial concentration of products to reactants is too large, and so we have to shift back to the left towards the reactants. If Q is much smaller than K, then we're going to shift to the right. So this means the initial concentrations of products to reactants is too small, and so we'll shift to the right to produce products. So let's look at an example. It says for the synthesis of ammonia at 500 Celsius, the equilibrium constant is 6 times 10 to the negative 2. Predict the direction in which the sh system will shift to reach equilibrium in each of the following cases. We're going to look at one case. Okay, so here are our initial concentrations, and we know that they're initial because of these little knots or zeros. Okay, so to find Q, this is equal to, now if you remember from the previous, equa um, the previous slide, the equation for the synthesis of ammonia was N2 plus 3H2 goes to 2NH3. So we use that to write our Q value. So we have the concentration of NH3 squared, initial, divided by 
concentration of N2 initial times the concentration of H2 cubed, and then also the initial concentration. So we can now just plug in our values. 1 times 10 to the negative 3 squared divided by our concentration of N2, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 5 times the concentration of H2, which is 2 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's cubed. So if you do all of your calculating, you should end up with 1.37 times 10 to the 7th. This is equal to Q. Our K value was 6 times 10 to the negative 2. So what this tells us is that Q is much larger than K. And this means that we need to decrease the product concentration, increase the reactant concentration, and that means it will shift to the left because we want to increase the reactants. Okay, well, um, most problems involve finding the equilibrium concentration of the reactants and products given a K value and then initial concentrations or sometimes initial pressures. So we're given initial, K, okay, and we want to find equilibrium. This can get very complicated mathematically depending on the situation. And so we're going to look at some examples where one or more equilibrium concentrations of pressures are known at the beginning, and that makes the math a little bit simpler. So let's look at an example. It says that at a certain temperature, a one liter flask initially contained 0.298 moles of PCL3 as a gas and 8.7 times 10 to the negative third moles of phosphorus pentafluoride, also a gas. After the system had reached equilibrium, 2 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of chlorine gas was found in the flask. Gaseous phosphorus pentachloride decomposes according to the reaction, and they're giving us the reaction. And they want us to calculate the equilibrium concentrations of all species and the value of K. So we've got a couple things to do. So let's go to a blank page and write down some knowns and unknowns. We know our volume is 1 liter. And we know that we had some initial moles. Well, because we're dealing in concentrations, we want molarity, which is moles per liter. Now, it works out really nicely that the volume is one liter because we can just take our moles, divide by one, and that gives us the molarity. So let's start with the reaction. We have PCl5 goes to PCl3, and these are all gases, plus Cl2. We're going to use this process that's called ICE. It stands for Initial Change in Equilibrium, and that's what's going to help us find equilibrium concentrations. So I'm just going to write it over here, because by using the equation, we can list all the information underneath each of the reactants. Okay, so in the problem, we were told that the initial concentration of PCO5 was 8.7 times 10 to the negative 3. And we know when we divide that by 1, our moles are going to end up being our concentration. We knew our initial PCL3 was 0.298 molar. And um, we didn't, we only had chlorine gas show up at the end of the reaction. So we're going to assume then that there was no chlorine gas present at the beginning of the reaction. We know at the end that we had. 2 times 10 to the negative third moles, so that at equilibrium. So I'm going to put that down here. So what this must mean then is that the chlorine gas changed by 2 times 10 to the negative third molarity. So that must mean that 2 molarity of the PCL5 decomposed to give Cl2 gas. So here we're going to subtract 2 and send to the negative third. And it's kind of like a math equation. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. If it lost, if PCL5 lost two molarity, the products gained it. So the PCL3 is also going to gain the same concentration. Okay, so now for our equilibrium, we're basically adding up the initial and the change. So 8.7 times 10 to the negative 3 minus 2 times 10 to the negative 3 gives us 6.7 and send to the negative 3. Here we are adding, and we're going to get 0.3 molar. So now we've got all of our equilibrium concentrations. 
Okay, so we can, so that's the first part of the answer. And then to find K, let's write our equation for K based on our um, balanced chemical equation. So we're going to take our products, and since they're all one to one, not going to worry about squaring or cubing anything, and we're dividing by our reactive. Okay, now we can plug in values because we're doing K. This is the final or equilibrium concentration. So Cl2 is 2 times 10 to the negative 3. PCl3 is 0.3. And PCl5 is 6.7 times 10 to the negative 3. So if you calculate all those values, you should get 8.96 times 10 to the negative 2. Remember, K has no units. Okay, so using this ICE system is going to be uh, really helpful for all of our chemical kinetics problems. Okay, sometimes uh, you won't be given any equilibrium concentrations or pressures. So in the last example, they gave us the equilibrium for Cl2. Sometimes you're not given that. So it involves a little bit more of a complicated process. Uh, also using the stoichiometry of the reaction to express the concentration at equilibrium in terms of the initial. And so we'll have some variables. So we'll look at uh, some examples of that in class. Otherwise, um, we will continue on 13.6 next time. Have a good day.